All right. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ray, man. You guys are awesome. Oh, praise God. Uh, man. Well, we're back. And uh, so uh, we were planning on doing um, continuing John. So uh, we left off on verse 13 of chapter 1 in John the last time that we did uh, the John study. So the plan was to go uh, John 1, 14 through 18. Um, I got through John 1, 14. So, uh, <laughs> so we're going to go through John 1, 14. But you know what? It was, it was packed. And I just couldn't move. I could not move past uh, for two weeks, man. I couldn't move past uh, verse 14. If you guys have read it, I mean, who hasn't read John? But when you really start looking at what John the Apostle, how he's just giving so much evidence of the deity of God, of Christ, of his, his, uh, his deity as, as, in, as Jesus Christ and, and God the Son, also in uh, the human flesh, man, in the body coming down uh, to, be, to spend that time with us. And um, so let's read uh, verse 14. Verse 14 in John 1 reads, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Father God, Lord, we just come before you, and we are so grateful for your word. And Lord, uh, what an amazing book that you uh, have allowed us to, to study. Lord, uh, what we're so grateful that you uh, commissioned John to write these words that just give such a clear picture of the love you have for us, of who you are, Lord, um, and, and God, that we don't miss, that we take our time through your word, uh, through John, and that we get to uh, grow in fellowship with you, Lord, and that we grow in a relationship, and Lord, more than that, that we walk with you, and that we are, as we go through your word, that we can uh, be servants uh, that are willing, Lord, to do your work, uh, Father God, always to glorify your name. Lord, go through, go through us tonight as we get into your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit speaks tonight, that you give us hearts to receive, Lord, and that um, we just, that at the end of, uh, of the study, we just have come that much closer to you and that we uh, know you that much more, God. And just the love you have is so, uh, it's just, there, there's no way to measure it. There's no way to even understand the love you have for us. And as we get into this chapter, and we get into this verse, Lord, that is just, it's so clear. Father God, thank you so much for loving us. Lord, thank you for coming uh, into this world in the flesh and for the cross, for dying on the cross and, and the resurrection, Lord, so that uh, you rose again, so that we can be with you in eternity. You took all of all of that burden that's on us, you took it onto yourself. All that sin, you took it upon you, Lord. And we're so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. So like I said, uh, Daniel's is asking, did I have two words that I camped on? Man, I camped on, I think, every other word. Um, we're going to start off with uh, 14 and the very first uh, five words. And the word became flesh. And the word became flesh. Yes, Christ came into this world flesh on bone you know meat on the bone a body he wasn't he didn't come here as a spirit uh some people might say that he walked here as the spirit he didn't come here as a you know as a supernatural being although he was right because he was god but he came and he and he came into this world and he became flesh and when i was thinking about flesh that's where i started to, I started to see that it was going to take a long time to go through this verse. When I was thinking about flesh, it's so much more than just the body that we're living in, right? If we go into Philippians 2, 5, 8, uh, 2, 5 through 8, if you guys want to turn there, if you just want to write it down, I'll read it to you guys. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, it reads, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And you know what? When I was reading that, when I was reading flesh, 
I started thinking, that's what took me to Philippians. I started thinking, what does it mean to be in the flesh? It means that Jesus experienced the nature of a human man. Not because he had to experience it because he didn't know it. He created us. He knows exactly what we go through. But he experienced it so that we would see, the, would see him, would see the light, and the word would come in the flesh. And we could not say, oh, God doesn't know what, what, uh, what I'm going through. He doesn't. Sure he does. He definitely does. You know, he came, he came to us with the, with the nature of man. And what does the flesh lean towards? The flesh lean towards sin. And, you know, I didn't want to put my, uh, I, I just wanted to go to scriptures with all this. Because if we go to Galatians um, 5, 19 through 21, it talks about that. So it's a Galatians 5, 19 through 21. It reads, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, un uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, uh, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish uh, ambitions, dissensions, heresies, um, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, you see, when he came in the flesh, he came and he experienced all of that. Okay, he came here and he experienced that. He wasn't, he wasn't immune to any of that. How you might hear other, other cults talking about how, well, of course, he, he, wasn't, uh, he didn't uh, give in to, to uh, temptation. Because he was God. Yes, he was God. He was fully God, but he fully was fully human. He came to dwell with us, to be with us. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. You know what? The flesh fights against the spirit. In Galatians 5.17, it reads, for the, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these, these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So the flesh and the spirit are in a constant battle, right? And that was, he, Jesus had that same battle. He had the same battle. If, if he hadn't had that battle, he wouldn't have asked for that cup to be taken from him, right? Because he still had that battle in him, right? In Matthew, uh, uh, you know, the, the flesh is described a lot of times as weak, right? And it's easily tempted. And being in the, being in the flesh, all of us here, I don't think any of us can deny that we are easily tempted and we're easily tempted by the things that we see, but why are we easily tempted and why wasn't Christ easily tempted? Because Christ seeked the father constantly. If wherever you read in the word about Jesus, he, he cried out to the Lord. He cried out to the father. He seeked the father. He spent time fasting. He spent time, uh, you know, in the scripture, right? So that when we do that it makes it a lot easier for us to not be to not fall into temptation but in uh matthew 26 41 it says watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak so i think i think we can um relate to that as human beings being in the flesh as christians as accepting christ as our lord and savior i think we can relate to the fact that the spirit living in us that we, we pray that the Holy Spirit lives in us. It gives us boldness, gives us strength. It gives us uh, the, the ability to not be tempted. But then the flesh comes in and we want to battle. And there's a battle between the spirit and the flesh. And when the flesh, uh, the flesh is weak, right? So the flesh wants to go ahead and, and it gives in. But the problem is a lot of times when, when speaking for myself, I don't know if you guys will re relate to this, but when my flesh gives in, to the temptation and puts the spirit aside is because I haven't been seeking. I haven't been walking. I haven't been in that relationship. Am I saying that we're backsliders? No, not necessarily, but you know what? Life gets busy and the enemy knows that man. Same knows that when we get busy with work, with family, with stuff that's going on in our lives, what's the first thing to go? The scriptures on the side, not, no, no scripture in the morning, no, uh, praying possibly, no spending time with the family and prayer and fellowship, right? So that's when the flesh gets weak. But see, going back again to Jesus, his priority was to be to seek the Father. His priority was to walk in that path. Okay, even still being in the flesh, even still being in that body. Although Jesus being God, 
God the Son, Elohim, part of the Trinity, right? He came to his creation, not only in a human body, but he also encompassed, again, I can't stress enough because I know that that's, you know, John is telling us here, he came into human nature. And this is so important because people will tell us that, again, going back, that Jesus didn't sin. Oh, he couldn't sin because he was God. That's why he didn't sin. That's why he didn't do that. So how, would, how, how disheartening would that be for us? If Jesus came down and he wasn't, he, he wasn't able to be, uh, to succumb to the same things that, that we uh, have, to, have to go through, right? Not that he felt for them. He never felt, he never felt temptation. He never gave in to any of that, any of that temptation, any of that lust, but he had to experience it, right? So that we could say that, you know what, Jesus, Jesus went through that, you know, um, and we hear that a lot. I hear that a lot from people when I witness to them. You know, when I talk to them about Christ, oh, he doesn't know what I'm going through because he didn't go through. He went through every single thing that we went through. In um, in Hebrews uh, four fifteen, Hebrews four fifteen says, "For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted." as we are, yet without sin. You see, the scriptures say it. I'm not saying it. The scriptures are saying it. He was tempted in all forms. He was tempted like we are, but he didn't sin. He didn't fall into that temptation, right? And it's, and it's not because he was, yes, he was God. Yes, he is God. But it's not because of that, because he came here to be that example, to be that light, and to be the, the living word, right? You know, this makes complete sense to me also, as I was reading through it, uh, throughout the entire Old Testament, how does God rule? God rules the world from a throne in heaven, right? People don't actually see God. Um, you know, he raised up prophets and, uh, and men to speak for him. His voice was heard. He, was provi he provided shade for coolness when the, when the Israelites were going through the desert. He provided uh, fire at night for warmth, right? And uh, he provided food every single day. They, were, they, never, uh, they never went hungry. They were never cold. They were never... Uh, extremely hot, and there's one of those things I always talk about. You know, their sandals never wore out, man. That's pretty amazing. Um, you know, yet the people still could say at that point, the Israelites to say, you know what? Why did they say? So why is it that when Moses went up and he was with the Lord, with the, you know, and the Lord was carving out the Ten Commandments, why did the people uh, they rebelled down there? They they got they got they went nuts down there, right? Because they, they, didn't, they didn't see him. Now, we still do it now, even though Christ came. But I'm saying he was, he was a God that they heard through prophets, that they heard uh, his voice, but they couldn't physically touch him, right? They couldn't, even, they couldn't come near him. You know, so what does he do? God, God the Father sends God the Son to actually physically experience all aspects of human nature. Okay? So now God came off of his throne, right? And I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know. He came off his throne to be in, to walk on this earth, man, to share that time with us, to experience what we experience so that we can't say, you know, we, we can't say, no, he didn't know. He doesn't know what that feels like. He does. Even though he didn't have to do it for himself. Like I said earlier, he did it for us. He did it for us. And Jesus grew up in an earthly family. He lived in a world, in a world that, you know, I'm sure he was tempted as a kid too, right? Kids get into arguments. He wasn't, there wasn't, I'm sure, although we don't see Jesus' childhood here, except for a few points, we don't see him in a bubble. I'm sure that he lived a, a daily life, right? Like we all did and like we all do, you know? And, uh, but we also know that for sure he was, he was for sure tempted by Satan, right? And uh, he was out there and he, uh, when he fasted for those 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And when did Satan uh, tempt him? When he was at his weakest, right? When he was at the end of the, at the, end of the time, right? When he was, uh, when he was hungry, and he was, you know, he was starting to just, that's when Satan hits us. Satan hits us when we are at our weakest point. And you know what? I, I wanted to look at that, even though we've read it, probably you've all read it a, a bunch of times. Matthew um, 4, 1 through 11. Sounds like a lot of verses, but uh, it really, uh, they're pretty short. So we're going to read them really uh, real quick, and we're going to go through these. So, then Jesus was led up, up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now, 
When the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into a holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in your hands they shall bear, bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory and their glory. And he said, and he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. The reason I read through that is because I, I, we've read it uh, again. You guys are all Bible, Bible uh, students. We all are Bible students here, right? We all love the word. But see, Jesus was tempted in different aspects, right? And Satan gave him scripture. But it was it was a uh, scripture that was used to, and it was turned, and it was it was prostituted, right? It wasn't the true scripture. And what did Jesus come back with? The the actual truth. He came back with the truth of the word for uh, for Satan. And you know what? It's a lot of times I'm looking at myself here. But at the same time, we're all we're probably on the same boat. You know, Satan likes to entice us that's where temptations come from especially at our weakest point jesus was at his weakest point there but he knew that he you know he he denied the flesh because jesus knew that the flesh will always let you down the flesh will always let me down it's never it's never a good thing and if we have a doubt we need to go to the word if we have a doubt of whatever it might be and you know what the things that satan was saying here we get confronted with all the time you know hey hey do this it'll be so much easier you know what do that and you'll have all of this stuff but you know what it's a temporary it, it's temporary it's, a te it's only a temporary of, of a good feeling for eternity without christ for eternity away from the lord you know and why did he or better yet how could he go to the truth of the scriptures you know why because he spent time in the scriptures he spent time with the father and and as i'm reading uh, John 14, man, and, and thinking about the flesh and thinking about temptation, I'm thinking about when the things that I deal with, you know, we're all buddies here. We're all friends, right? We're all brothers in Christ. Hey, I deal with uh, some of you that know me a little bit might, might see that I have a little bit of a sharp edge when I talk to people, especially if, uh, you know, if I don't agree, right? Dennis, don't be laughing, Dennis. I see you. <laughs> all right. I have a little bit of a sharp edge, but you know what? That's sin, man. That's sin. And that's because I need to be focused more on what the scriptures say. I may be reading them, but you know what? They need to be really working inside of me. You know, some of you might see that, you know, you might know that part of me, especially if you might've gone on a mission trip, you might see that once in a while, you know, in the field. But, um, you know, but see, we need to be in the word. And that's what the difference is here. It's not that Jesus was God, although he is God. It's that he came in the flesh, he experienced human nature. He experienced what we experience every day. And he, he didn't fall into it because he was in the word, because he was with the father, because he spent time in prayer. That was his priority. And as Christians, man, wow. I mean, it's, it's so heavy. And, and the more I, I was reading this and the more I, I kept getting stuck on, on the flesh part, um, I kept thinking, man, I don't spend enough time with the Lord in the morning. Not as a condemnation, more like a conviction, like, man. No, not because, oh, I didn't pray that much today, so God's not going to be with me. No, none of that. It's like, man, I want to seek God more so I can be on that path. You know, when we want to fellowship with somebody, when we want to spend time with somebody and we get to know them, right, they, that, that relationship comes in, that, that same thinking comes in. And when there's a disagreement, that person that, uh, that has the, you know, that has the scripture is going to give us the, you know, the, the solving of that disagreement. And he's going to give it through his scripture, whether it's, you or the other guy or me or the other guy. And here, Jesus was in the word. Jesus didn't fall into temptation because of that. And all that to say that he was in the flesh, not just the body. 
he was he he encompassed what it is to be the nature of a man of a human so and then he goes on to say um and dwelt among us another word i was thinking dwelt what does dwelt mean dwelt literally means in the scripture it means uh to pitch a tent but more literally when i was looking it up it means a uh, tabernacle a place where god met his people how perfect is that how perfect is that you know god met uh the priest we were talking about this earlier we're laughing about these curtains right here right um and uh you know nobody could go in there because if you if you were there and uh and you were in the presence of god man you had to be perfection or you would be gone i mean you wouldn't make it out alive right in exodus 40 34 through 38 let's check that out real quick because we're gonna go back a little bit exodus 40 34 through 38 um 34 to 38 um, we read then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the lord filled the tabernacle and moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the lord filled the tabernacle whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle the children of israel would go onward in all their journey but if the cloud was not taken up then they uh, they did not journey till the day that it was taken up for the cloud of the lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of israel throughout all their journeys so you see the israelites throughout their journey from egypt to the promised land for 40 years roughly right um they were in the presence of the lord but they didn't see the lord in in body form right they saw him as a cloud that covered them during the day and gave them shade uh as fire at night that uh, gave them warmth and gave them light right so god dwelt with them every day in this manner and that's how he showed himself to them and how he led them his glory dwelt among the israelites man imagine that even just that imagine walking in a group of a million people a couple million people and you physically see god's god there in the form of cloud in the form of, of, of fire i mean that i can't imagine that but he dwelt with them that way he came down he dwelt that way now with us though the word dwelt among us god sent his son to live with us in the flesh as was mentioned earlier in a physical human body with us that's the difference man with us christ came down right you know and he came down in the body and, and if we we're going to talk about tabernacles man we were able to go right to christ he was there the tabernacle was there he dwelt with us right he dwelt with the apostles and as christians we know this we all know this for sure i can't there's no way to explain it uh other than that we know it because we're christians we read the word so why i was asking myself why does john think it's so important to make it so clear and you know what because we may you know like me you know we might see it we might read it but are we really grasping how huge it is you know i, I always think of when we minister to people when i was reading this about the flesh and reading about him about christ dwelling with us man the tabernacle tenting with us right when we share the gospel we share we, we share the gospel we share the cross we share christ's sacrifice we share um his uh you know that he was beaten that he was crucified and he rose again without that we have no christianity without that we have no salvation we have no covering for our sin but as i'm reading this i'm thinking man this john the apostle here is painting such a beautiful picture of how much god truly loved us and it's almost like Man, why don't we put that in there when we're minute when we're sharing with you? Why don't I put that in there when I'm sharing with you? You know why? Because I never looked at it this way as I've been seeing it and reading it these last two weeks. You know, um, you know, in Exodus we read that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and because of that, Moses could not go inside. Moses couldn't go inside the tabernacle because the glory of the Lord was in there, right? Um, but you see, the glory of the Lord came down to us in Jesus Christ, unlike the tabernacle uh god told moses to build he sent his only begotten son to tabernacle with us that we could we can meet him right there right the apostles were there 
you know, when we're able to enter with him, we are able to enter with this important man. This is so huge. And you all know it, but it's, it's like rereading it. It's so huge. We're able to enter into the glory of God because of the covering of Christ, because he came down, man. With him, we're able to be in the presence of God. But without him, we can't. And then, you know what? Let's go on. John goes on to write in verse, uh, in the next part of 14. He writes, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And then let's go straight to Peter. In uh, 2 Peter 1.16, I like what he writes because um, he's going to confirm what John is, uh, is writing here. Only not by John, but what Peter says. So it's, Peter, it's 2 Peter um, 1.16. 2 Peter 1.16, Peter writes, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay, so Peter here is talking about being an eyewitness to God's, to Christ's majesty, to his glory. John the apostle here is writing about beholding his glory. And you know, I, I was telling Dennis, you know, there's a bunch of words that I camped on, right? One of them was behold. You know, Peter, James, and John, when they were in the Mount of Transfiguration, we're going to go there in a minute. Um, they didn't just see what was going on. They beheld it. Man, when we behold something, it's to behold something is to, like, to treasure it, to experience it, to be a part of it, not just to watch it. We can watch something. We can see something happen. It makes no difference to us. But to behold, such a, such a small word here in, in all minor case letters, but so huge when it talks about what John, Peter, and James saw that day at the Mount of Transfiguration, they beheld it. They saw something that nobody else got to see. They saw something amazing, something that it was just for them to watch at that moment. And they beheld it. They, they grasped it. They got it. They, man, they experienced it. I don't even know how to, if there are any other words, they were in awe of it, right? And that's how I, that, as I'm reading this and I've read that one word, I'm thinking, man, that's how, I love the word and it's exciting for me, but man, am I really beholding that word? Am I really taking it in in awe? And am I really taking it in like, man, Christ came in the flesh, man. He lived a life of temptation just so that we could have eternal life with him. But let's, let's turn to Matthew 17, 1, 8 and uh, 1 through 8 and see, um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Matthew 17, 1 through 8. I hope I'm not going too fast. I get, a little, uh, I get a little talky and fast when I get nervous, but this is exciting, and I, I really want to get through it. So uh, Matthew 17, 1 through 8, uh, we read, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on the high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, again, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, uh, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. When they had lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus alone. So I'm reading this, and there you go. Uh, Peter asked Jesus if they can build, if, if we should build three tabernacles, right? Or three tents for these guys, for Moses, Elijah, and for him. And you know, like all, like all the other guys that are out there that read this, they go, oh man, Peter, crazy Peter wants to build three tents, doesn't want to leave the mountain, you know, it's, that's where all the glory is. You know, yeah, that's true. Peter was, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm that Peter all the time. I'm the guy that before I start thinking, I start acting. Before I say, my lips start moving. Before I, my brain starts, you know, even thinking the first letter of a, of a word that makes sense, right? Well, as I'm reading this and I'm, and I'm reading uh, in Matthew, I see something that I'd never really realized before. 
it said that his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them. God's glory came down, man, on, on Christ, man. He came, he came down that day, and something that I never really realized uh, is that at the end of the day, when that all happened, Peter, James, and John were still alive. Unlike, and you know, be patient with me on this one because this really, it was like, I, I struggled with it. Unlike the high priest going into the tabernacle, and like uh, Chris was saying earlier, man, he had to tie a rope around his leg because he didn't know he didn't know if he was gonna make it out alive. These three guys witnessed the glory of God coming down on his on, on his son and were still alive. Why were they still alive? The only reason they're still alive, because they saw his glory through Christ, man. That's the only way we can see God's glory, man. I mean, even as I talk about it right now, it just blows my mind. That's the only way we can see God's glory and live man through jesus christ that's why he came to cover us of our sins man to 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 die on the cross carry the burden of our sin and and rise again and when god sees us he doesn't see us our sin he sees us through christ man and we see his glory through christ because we're we're imperfect people man and this might seem obvious to you guys but to me it blew my mind you know but i like to mention you know but like like i mentioned with peter i missed that fact that Peter, James, and John were all still present at the Mount of Transfiguration and lived physically witnessing God's full glory in Jesus. God showed his glory through our Savior, man. And that was that blew my mind. You know what? In Exodus 3320, uh, you guys can turn there, you can you know take notes and uh, read it later. But in Exodus 30, uh, 3320, we read, but the first uh 33, I, might, I might have given you the wrong one, but I do have the right scripture. <laughs> I'll give you the right address later if I can find it. But he said, you cannot see my face for no, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, uh, the Lord said, here is a place by me and you shall stand on the rock so that, uh, so that it shall be while my glory passes by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see uh, my back, but my face, uh, my face shall not be seen. So I was thinking about that because I want you know. I, again, I just want to give scripture for scripture, man. I don't want to. I'm, I'm not giving any of my thoughts here, and I'm thinking about God's glory coming down on Christ. These guys seen it, and they see it through Christ. And then I'm looking here at Moses uh, being up there, uh, up on the mountain. And uh, God's and he Moses wants to see him, man. He wants to see his glory. And God's like, you can't, you can't see it because if you do, you're gonna die, man. And um, you know, at that moment, fellowship with God. At that moment, I'm thinking about this. At the moment that Peter, James, and John saw God's glory coming down on the sun, and they lived through it because it came through Christ. They saw it through Christ. Fellowship was about to change with God fellowship was about we didn't know it they probably didn't know it at that moment but fellowship was going to change and what was going to change at the cross right but that was a glimpse of that right fellowship was changing glory came down and they lived you know moses stood on the rock and god put him in the cleft of the rock as he passed by him had jesus not been there had jesus not been there that day with peter uh, peter james and john they would they wouldn't have made it they would have they would have made they would have witnessed it and, and and been gone but christ was there christ jesus he you know they witnessed it through him he's our hiding place right he's the one that covers our sins he's that cleft in the rock man that we can be in as as god as god's glory comes down man we're we we stand there and we have that that peace of knowing that man he's our savior but we also get to experience his glory and how do we experience it? They got to see it. Those three guys got to see it. We get to experience it in his word. And through these amazing men that, man, that are teaching us through, through the word, that God commissioned to write the, to write the word. God spoke to the prophets. He showed himself through the cloud by day and fire by night. And Moses, or anyone for that matter, that, that would, that would uh, be in God's presence, they wouldn't make it alive. They wouldn't make it out, right? 
Only the high priest was able to go in, and even that guy. Only the high priest was able to go into the tabernacle, and even that guy didn't know if he was going to come out alive. But yet, through Christ, man, we can meet, we can meet God. We can meet the Father, man. And all of our sins are, are removed, they're taken away. And I don't want to, you know what, there's, there's a verse. I don't want to take a, a, another avenue here, but I, I didn't want to leave verse 9 out in Matthew 17. Um, I thought it was real important for me. Uh, and again, I'm going to be honest and, 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 you know, frank with you guys, I'll be open about how I am because, you know, we're, we're doing a study. We're all brothers here in Matthew, uh, 17 verse nine. It says, now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one until the son of man is risen from the dead. And I'm thinking, okay, this is, how am I going to, why, why? Cause you know what? On my notes for the last week or so, I've been putting this in and taking it out putting it in and taking it out. But the reason I left that in there is because, man, these guys just saw a life-changing vision. They just saw something that nobody else is going to see. And God allowed them to see it, right? Now they're told by Jesus, you know what? You can't tell anybody what you saw, you know? But you can't tell anybody, but there is. He does say, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So he told them when they can when they can share it, right? And you know, something that just came out and punched me in the face and slapped me was something that I struggle with all the time and something I deal with is, you know, I'm seeking the Lord, I'm praying, the Lord's put something in my heart. And you know what? A lot of times I wear my thoughts and I wear everything on my sleeve, man. And I can keep stuff in me. I and I talk to somebody about it. And you know what? Sometimes God doesn't want uh doesn't want us to tell people what he's what he's where he's taking us sometimes god doesn't want us to talk to anybody about what he's shown us in the scriptures that morning or something that we've been praying about for days weeks months years and he shows us what he's going to do but he's telling us and we know he is because i know he when he's telling me you know um not to not to share something but you know what man my my flesh is weak so what do i do man i tell oh man i think the lord wants me to do this and god's like man you know i didn't want you to say it. it's not ready yet I'm not ready for you to share that yet i'm not ready for you to tell anybody that yet you know um i was talking to dave the other day and in an example that uh that he was talking about is people man you guys all know mickey she's our missionary in haiti and uh man man a woman that loves the lord greatly and the lord speaks to her and man she will not talk about what the lord tells her until the due time she'll say oh man three years ago that you know because it's time it's time to talk about it imagine if these guys would have came off of that mount and they would have told everybody what they saw it wasn't time yet but yet i thought it was important uh because we talk about stuff that you know that we should, probably shouldn't be mentioning yet because it's not the Lord doesn't want us to talk about it yet. Um, it's not time, and not that it spoils anything, but the fact of the matter is, you know what? God's still going to do what He's going to do, but where's the glory go? It goes to us sometimes because we we point it out. So um, again, I love I love the example that Mickey is to me in Haiti because she is so faithful to what the Lord, how the Lord speaks to her, and she just retains it until the time the lord tells her to give it up and man we know it i know that i know it i just you know i'm, I'm a fool so <laughs> the flesh flesh takes over right and uh but man so i thought that that was important to put in there because now christ is risen john is talking is, is sharing evidence of christ man he's giving evidence of who jesus was and now he's talking about it and peter talked about it i thought that was amazing then john goes on to write um he goes on to write as of the only begotten of the father right the only begotten of the father here the word begotten again this is one of those controversial words that cults use that people try to use when you try to witness to them if you give them a scripture like this and you say well you see right there it says god that's god's son he created him he's a creation of god he's not uh he's not god he's a prophet you know or he's you know whatever you want to be you know whatever you want to be and the problem with that is that 
uh, when we read the Bible, we need to, we need to take into consideration um, the language that is trans, uh, translated into. Okay, so English uh, doesn't come close to have the amount of words that the Greek has, right? I don't read Greek at all, but man, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of resources nowadays that we can go to, right? So when it talks about being the begotten, begotten, the meaning in this case, what John is, uh, is referring to here is the only one, one of a kind. There's no other like him. He's talking about the deity of Christ, the, of Christ being God. And the word, if you guys want to look it up and kind of see the, the, what the meaning is, I don't know if I'm going to even say it right, but it's monogamous, and it's M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E-S. And I, I looked it up because I wanted to know, man, what begotten, that's a very confusing word when we share with people. And when people come to your door, what do they tell you? Oh, yeah, he's a prophet. Oh, yeah, he was a wise man. Oh, yeah, you know, he's created by God. Oh, he's Satan's brother. You know, there are all these, these different things. But it's, you know why? Because people interpret the word the way they want to, not the way it's written, not in truth, right? So I thought that that was important um, to mention. And then uh, it go, he goes on to write, so that Jesus was full. Here we're going to get into where uh, Dennis was waiting on. He was full of grace and truth grace and truth and what does it mean to be full so man this is this is again as we're breaking this down this ver this verse 14 was so he just it just blew my mind the word full as we think of you know you fill up your tank it's not really full right you fill up in food whatever but the word full here means to be perfect to be complete everything about jesus here is grace and is truth god's grace to us is christ it's full there is nothing there's no more of it it is complete it's perfection right how many more ways can we say that that jesus is full of grace and fully truth right we rely on god's grace through christ for our salvation of course we do that's we know that as christians um I'm not, I'm not telling you anything you, you don't already know, but what exactly is grace? And we always say what grace is, unmerited favor. Grace is getting something we, uh, we do. We, grace is getting something um, that, we don't, that we didn't earn and that we didn't deserve, right? And you see, we deserve judgment. So we know that. As Christians, we know that. We know that we are saved by grace. And there was mercy shown on the cross, right? So grace doesn't come. But see, grace came through us through Christ. But Grace doesn't come with guilt, and it doesn't come with condemnation. It doesn't come with finger pointing. You know, grace doesn't have any of that. Grace comes to us plain and simple. It's full. Jesus is all grace, okay? And that grace is available to the world, right? Just not everybody accepts that grace. Not everybody takes it in. Many reject it, right? There's no, there's no requirements for that grace, sort of, right? And I don't know about you guys, but I'm think, I was thinking about myself because I've had this conversation before with some other brothers about grace. Are we, as guys, as, as human beings in the flesh, able to give out grace or to show grace? You know? And um, you know, honestly, as I, if I'm going to be honest, there's no way I can show perfect grace because that's what full, full of grace is. That's what Christ is. He's perfect grace. He's all of grace. There's no condemnation. There's no finger pointing. There's no guilt in it, you know. And as I'm thinking about it, I can't show grace to everybody. I might be able to show the most amount of grace to my kid, to my spouse, or to my mom. But even then, there's going to be bias because I live in this flesh, man. But Christ had not, none of that. It's perfect grace, right? You know, um, my, our flesh and our pride, you know, it gets in the way of pure grace that's why we need christ man his grace is perfect his grace is all that we need and that's jesus being full of grace right because if we require something for grace it's no longer grace because now it's something that is earned so we can't require grace and he doesn't require anything of us for grace it was given to the world all we have to do is accept it you know the grace has been offered to every single person in the world but very few have accepted it, have accepted him. And it's crazy because most people have actually rejected him. And why, the reason I put him in there is because he is grace. 
Christ is grace, right? And there's freedom in grace because we don't have to work for it, right? And the fact, uh, and the fact that there's absolutely nothing we can do to attain it is where the freedom comes in. The grace is there. Now, John goes on to say that Jesus is full of truth also. You see, the grace is there for, for, all, for all of us to receive. The truth that is Jesus is for us to believe, right? We receive his grace, but we must believe the truth and we must accept the truth. And it sounds crazy. Oh, yeah, I believe the truth of the Bible. Oh, I, I accept the truth of Christ. I accept Jesus. You know, it sounds obvious. Again, I, I'm saying this because I know that we're all, we all read the Bible and we all study. You know, it sounds obvious. But um, if it's so obvious, then why are there so many Christians out there claiming to be Christians, but yet reject the truth of the word, which John is telling us is, is Jesus Christ? There's a lot of Christians out there. There's a, and I'm not saying the guy who backslid. I'm not saying the guy who, you know, who's tempted to, and struggling man in, in your walk. Because you, that guy that's struggling, that is, is wanting to be right, that guy believes in the truth of Christ, man. He believes in Jesus being full truth, being the word, right? I'm talking about, and I'm going to give an example here. It, it don't blow me out of the water if it doesn't, uh, if it's not 100, 110%, might be 99%. But you know what? The only example, one of the examples I can think of, which is probably an obvious one, something that the world is going through right now, one of them is um, same-sex marriage, man. You have these, you know, down where I work out in L.A., there's, a, there's a, a Christian church. They say they read the Bible, um, and they are uh, a homosexual-type church. So what they say is that there's nothing in the Bible that says that, um, that God is against uh, one person loving another, even if it's the same sex. The problem here is when we, if we were to give that person a scripture, if I, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about my own family. I have a family member, right? When I give them that scripture that talks about uh, people who, who are, you know, committing a acts of same sex marriage or, or homosexuality that they won't see the kingdom of God. When I give them those, the truth of the scripture, when they reject that, that's the truth. When they reject that truth, they no longer fall under, they can't partake of the grace. They're rejecting the grace, right? The grace is there for them to take, but if they reject the word, the truth of the word, they're rejecting, they, 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 can't, they can't partake of that grace. I don't know if you guys can understand where I'm, where I'm trying to go here. You know what? Because you could also have a guy who's living the homosexual lifestyle or not, but he believes the truth and he's trying to fight. He's trying to battle that thing. He's trying to get out of it. He's falling under that grace, man. And God's working on him and God's working with them and bringing him out of it. So that grace is there to be taken because man, they know the truth. They accept the truth. They believe the truth and they want to live the truth. So that grace falls on them. It's the, it's the ones that reject. And I'm using that because it's like a big example. It's used a lot, but there are so many other ways. There's so many times when people twist the scriptures to make, them, to make them work for their situation. And that's rejecting the truth. And that no longer, you no longer fall under the grace. You can't partake of the grace if you reject the truth of the scripture. You know, um, the same thing with, you know, fornication, man. With, you know, we've all been there. We're all guys, right? And a lot of us are pretty, you know, older. Some of us have been in the military. We've done stupid things in our lives, right? But the fact of the matter is, just because you, you love somebody, uh, and we're talking about, you know, a regular male-female marriage here, it's because you love that person. Just because you've been with that person for 15 years, uh, the Bible doesn't say that because of that time, you, uh, you're able to have sex, right? You're able to fornicate. The Bible doesn't say that. But yet we have Christians that will disagree with the scripture. At that point, where does the grace fall? They can't partake. I don't, according to the scripture, I don't think they can partake of that grace because they're not following the truth of the scripture. Can they be saved? Absolutely. I mean, that's why we continue to minister to them. But at that point, they're not falling in, under the grace, but the grace is there for everybody to take, right? And then I just wanted to mention, which is the most obvious, which is the cults, right? When they come to your door and they tell you things out of, out of a Bible that looks just like our own, but the words are twisted 
to fit their agenda and to fit what they want it to be, you know, um, telling you that again, that Jesus was a prophet, uh, Satan's brother created by God, you know, that's, those are, those are, that's rejection of the truth. And at that point, the grace is still there, man. I don't, I want to make sure that we understand that the grace is still there, but at that moment, they can't partake of that grace because they're rejecting the truth. And if God is full grace, fully grace, and he's full, full of grace, and he's fully truth, then the two go hand in hand, right? We have to be in the truth of Christ to partake of that grace, right? And it's there. So you see, grace through Jesus is for everyone. Since he is, since he's also the fullness of truth, without believing and accepting the full truth that is Christ, you can't partake of the grace. But you know what? I didn't partake of the grace for 35 years until I came to the Lord. So don't give up on those that you're ministering to. If you're in that place right now, man, go to the truth of the scriptures and follow the truth. Talk to your group leader. Talk to Pastor Phil. Talk to me. Whoever you get. You know, you got plenty of guys that we are so imperfect that we can relate. <laughs> We're all so imperfect that we can relate. You know, but, you know, I want to say that that we believe the truth of the scripture. We believe that Jesus is the truth. We believe that his grace is upon us, man. And that's why we have salvation. And um, man, I pray you guys understood my rambling here and that it made sense to you. And, uh, and man, we're just going to close out right now. Father God, Lord, we just come before you. And oh God, thank you. Thank you for just showing your glory, your majesty to these three apostles, Lord that they could witness that so that they can share that same witness, that same vision that they, that they were able to see with us today, Lord, 2000 years later, what a blessing, what an honor it is to be in your word. What an honor it is to be uh, able to come to you because of the love that you have for us, Lord, through your son, Jesus Christ. He did not have to come. Lord, I know you didn't. I know you didn't have to go to the cross. But yet you did it with so much love. You did it with, with so much tenderness and so much compassion. You, you are full of grace for everyone to partake of. And Lord, that we just help us to stay in your truth. The truth that you are. The, you are the word. You are the light. That we stay in, in the word, which is you. We stay in the light. Uh, that you light our path and Lord that we just continue to uh, to be vessels filled by you and not just hearers of your word Lord but that we can uh, you give us the strength and you give us the boldness to be doers of your word and uh, Father God Lord we just come before you tonight I pray for every single one of us that are in the study tonight that you strengthen us Lord after after hearing your word and after uh, being in your word the enemy wants to strike but Lord, I pray that you give joy and you give uh, wisdom tonight and discernment to all of us that the enemy will not, will not uh, try and steal the glory and the joy that we have seen in you tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.